Uh, well, Only two Indians here. All <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right, and they're all on the podium. Collar. Okay, okay. I sure it is. Hello, hello. Oh, oh yes, good. Very nice. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, we are really grateful to see you here. <laughs> uh, without you, we'll be very lonely. We can see more people on the podium <laughs> than in the audience. Sometimes one is a multitude. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, of course. I do like that one. I like it very much. Um, uh, ODR, we're going to talk about these, online dispute resolution. Uh, what is interesting is that even though this is the third Internet Governance Forum, this is very first workshop on ODR. Um, I, I've been wondering why nobody bring, ever brought this topic to IGF. Um, so that is the reason uh, we decided to, to do a workshop. Uh, but, but it seems few people are interested <laughs> in this topic. We also less people in this room. Uh, today we have very distinguished panel here. Um, on my far left, that's, oh, right. Is this a requirement? I want to hold it. <laughs> That's because I'm a teacher. I'm always use microphone. It's, it's kept here. The audibility is more. Oh wow! It's more stable. Uh, are you sure I have to put it here? But doesn't matter. We're so. We just have a few here. We, we, we don't even need a microphone. <laughs> oh, yes, but this is, um, <laughs> this is not a resolution. It's only a consensus here. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Mr. Jeff Ariste, um, who is the, uh, uh, is the leader of the Internet Bar. Um, he's practicing in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And my far right. Uh, there's uh, Mr. Pawan Dugo. Um, well, everybody knows him on the AGF. He organized so many workshops, um, including the one <laughs> in which I presented on UDRP. And this is Professor Vivekanandan. He's teaching in NASA University in Hyderabad. Um, and for your information, NASA University was ranked as the uh, best law school in India. Last year, this is 2007. Not this year. This year, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, okay, we have a professor from the best law school um, in India. Very nice. Um, uh, well, we have two more speakers. They're not here, but they are on the internet. Um, we have Mr. Uh, Daniel Rini, who is the director and ombudsman of American Online Mediation Board. And we have uh, Mr. Granham Ross. He is the executive director of Mediation Room. It's an online mediation proceeding. So they are going to share their experience with us. And since this is a IGF Internet Governance Forum, we should use the internet, this technology. Um, so we're going to call them through the internet. Okay, um, I guess our speakers have a lot of uh, interesting information and knowledge to share with you, uh, so I won't waste the precious time. Um, shall we start from Mr. Daniel? Would you please turn on my screen? Hi, hello Daniel. We, we started. Oh, hi, hello. Hello. We want to show you your image on screen. It is coming out. Yeah, we start right now. Very good. Sorry, would you please check connection? Oh. So 
know what is happening. This is going to be. This has to be like this. This is the. We're going to use that top, right? Yes. Easy to Right. Okay. 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 That's a technological issue. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, right, yes. We're seeking uh, solutions to this. <laughs> Is the technology not uh, cooperating? Um, <laughs> exactly they the are, case. They are resurrecting it. <laughs> All right. Yes, exactly. We're waiting for the resurrection. Uh, of the uh, technology, okay. <laughs> of, the, of the PowerPoint, <laughs> the projector. Um, well, there's, now it's nothing on the screen. <laughs> can you hear me in the room? Yes. I can, I can yes. hear you very well, yes. Okay, uh, da <laughs> da Daniel, um, I assume you're going to give a oversight of the ODR system. Um, yes, I think I, what, I, what I was asked to do is um, give sort of a groundwork and uh, set some definitions and some basic relationships between e-governance and online dispute resolution and e-governance. So I'm quite prepared to do that, at least to start the conversation. Uh, that's uh, Mr. Rainey, R-A-I-N, that's right here. Oh. Yes, wait, I tried just now. Uh, oh, there. Yeah. 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 I, we lost your uh, video. Do you still have my audio? Yeah. Oh, I have audio here. Audio is working, but this has been updated. Oh well. <laughs> so, <laughs> hi, hello. <laughs> so, what is the problem? There's a video here. Now it's disappeared. Just turn on. Okay. Change the settings. In one second. I'm too far. Ah, got ten. Ah, that is ten screen. Ah, screen. Ten screen. I'm sorry to be such a problem. Oh uh, no 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 no. Well, I'm sure that's not the solution. <laughs> no, and this is not the problem. The system, sir. <laughs> Let me do this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway. Okay. Oh well. Uh, Daniel. Yes. Um, I'm going to hang off and call you again to see if the video is working. Is this okay? Okay. Right. Very good, okay. yes. Okay, I'm back again. Well, still, we cannot see your image. This is unfortunate. Oh. <laughs> uh, Daniel is here. He's right here. Um, he's on the line, but did the video just was not working. Well, Daniel, um, okay, we don't need the image. <laughs> Daniel, why don't we do this? I just talked to the um, audience. We can hear you very well. Okay, we can hear that. Uh, we, this is unfortunate. We, we cannot see you. <laughs> uh, that's okay. We can go, uh, go with what we have. Um, so anytime you're ready for me to begin, just let me know. It, well, I don't understand. What do you mean to change the browser? 
this one you are web page you access that and the uh, video of this will be technology here i've been promoted uh, to the first position now from the second position so i am planning to give a overview of odr from a indian perspective somebody may wonder that uh, is there national perspectives to odr itself or in internet itself but uh, the question when i say is not uh, in the conceptual sense but rather uh, what is the status of odr and then how it's uh, it's uh, it's it's non existence or existence in indian context and so i wanted to throw some light on that so so my presentation here uh, i just want i like this quote very much we are approaching the new era with 21st century technologies 20th century governance processes and 19th century governance structures say that again i like that uh, it's not coming there huh? okay <laughs> that's okay. yeah can, eh? can you put it yeah 21st century technology 20th century uh, yeah yeah i think it's better if i see that <laughs> okay it's coming yeah oh okay it just comes briefly and then it goes back yeah that's it oh. so this by professor linstone from portland uh, it's so apt in indian context that uh, the, every second indian who enters europe or us is an information technologist and then back home we have governance processes which are more set little pre independence we have a civil service we have a judicial system which courts quite often gloriously pre independence and our laws are very interestingly dates back to uh, early 19th century whether it's indian penal court which uh, more or less takes our criminal law it's you know in 18 you know 50s whether our uh, old telecommunication act whether our evidence act everything is 1800 1870 1872 and then we have people who are governing that are uh, post independence people who have a little mindset but they are they are tackling things what they call as 21st century technologies so it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a amazing thing how this thing comes so the subject what i want to tell is as part of odr is a question of technology and law and so you really find law operating you know a century back and then technologies which are which they are confronting or they're trying to do is something 21st century and it's not something india is very peculiar we do understand others are slightly better but this uh, again comes from an american professor probably is meaning what is happening in the united states and so it more aptly fits in india in a classical way and so uh, the interface of law and technology if i put it where odia comes into uh, i mean the challenge for odia comes is that uh, one of my uh, one of my american professor told me uh, the technology is always the speeding curve and then uh, Uh, law is the policeman trying to give a ticket to that that's what he was trying to tell the interface between law and technology and another indian professor converted that in a typical hindu marriage the the bride groom walks seven steps before the bride and the bride walks seven steps behind always so he always said that uh, the technology is the bride groom who walks seven steps and the law is you know walking behind like the hindu bride and so do they will they catch up will they walk together or you know is it possible that is a big question so if i put it uh, yeah f- defining odr if i put it in a four dimension fx they call it or fourth party of odr what is being uh, generally said uh in the other models in the developed world but i, I think more of your all of you are familiar but just uh, you know i'm just putting it it is uh, adr transformed online uh, that is the concept when you look at internet so adr is there always and then adr gets transformed so odr is not necessary internet related it can also be taking up offline disputes through online not necessarily is restricted to uh, online disputes online you can bring in offline disputes also online to discuss things so that is a big potential so it is not limited to you know tech uh, technocrats or geeks or things like that so convergence will make internet video conference and even direct to home could be part of odr so these are the potential possibilities uh, so odr is a fourth party that's what they call and if i look at the aba definition uh, which is uh, little on the forefront it encompasses many forms of adr 
court proceedings that incorporate use of internet, websites, email communications, streaming media, and other information technology as part of the dispute resolution process. So conventional dispute resolution in India, uh, let me give you some statistics to you, which will be very amazing. There are 3 million cases pending in 21 high courts in India. 3 million cases pending in 21 high courts all over India as of now. This is the latest figure released a couple of months back. And this figure was not officially released by the government. Somebody has to file a right to information, and then they have to give that information. So this information came. 26.3 million cases are pending in subordinate courts. Put together, that's about 30 million. That's about 10% of US population. Right? And then there are 250,000 under trials still in prison. And more than 2,000 under trials in jail for more than five years. We don't know they are innocent, whether they are guilty. They are more than five years inside prison. This is the ministry, law ministry, giving its official statistics about the enormity in terms of dispute resolution in the conventional sense through our judicial system, through the courts. So this is a highlight for you. And now counter this uh, paradox in India with uh, this is the kind of uh, dispute resolution issues. Now I counter the technology phase of India. That throws very interesting, 11 million internet subscribers, 84 million internet users, because many people use in office and governments, you don't need to really own something in India. There's always in a public space where they use. 1.75 million IT manpower, 1.8 million cyber caves where you can walk in and do that, even whether you have internet or no internet personal connection. There are 500,000 IN domain names, 4.5 million broadband subscribers, and 700,000 kilometers of fiber route has been laid. So contrast this. So here is 30 million cases, one side pending. On the other side is a phase, a emerging phase of you know, technology in India and its prowess in internet. So the question is the disconnect in the whole thing. So look at the disconnect. Technology and business is in the forefront in the last two decades in India. Uh, more than getting scared about MNCs, uh, most Indian companies have become predators and they have been left, right, and buying things. And the technology process is very well proven in Indian context uh, for, uh, with whatever limitations, but still it is a big technology power. And business acumen is quite high, and they are marching around, and they are acquiring with confidence around. And so this is the two parts. But what happens in the triumvirate between technology, business, and rule of law? That is the biggest, biggest, biggest problem in India. The whole question is that, um, uh, leave alone modern design tools, stools, the old stool, they say at least you need three legs prop for properly any development to sit on. And the two are, two are really good models. There are, there are models, indigenous models, which are even taught in business law schools abroad. But to look at rule of law and dispute resolution is the biggest problem. And that is the biggest problem in terms of investment coming in. Leave alone foreigners, for Indians also, there is a steady decline of faith in the entire judicial process because for the simple reason that they consider this dispute resolution is something which they cannot rely on or the enormity of these cases which I put into you <coughs> to uh, slightly put back in a very practical sense there was this uh, a lawyer who has good standing in practice a conventional lawyer from a conventional university who had his bright young son in a new law school like ours you know which who comes and studies and then enters in practice with him and then he tells his son that uh, forget about what all they taught you in law school this is courtroom settings and he, this needs enormous experience so you simply watch me what I do for next two years and don't try anything funny and then the son was frustrated, but uh, father has the office and the client, so he has to keep quiet. And then father left for abroad, and he told, there's a major case coming up. I simply want you to get an adjournment and come back. That's it you have to do. And then he leaves the son, and then goes abroad for a week, comes back to see his son very jubilant. And he says, uh, you underestimated me. He said, what happened? I said, I won the case. I didn't ask for an adjournment. I argued, won the case. And then father was in fits. He told you, bloody fool, last 20 years I'm handling the case. I made you to study with that money. I was planning to get you married with that particular client. And then you have 
was the case now, what will I do, you know, for the future? So this is just light, lighter way of putting it. What happens about vested interest also? So conventional dispute resolution was something which was there in Indian context. ADR is slightly new, but we had something called the panchayat system in the villages where the village elders sit down and solve cases more amicably in a win-win situation. That was pre-British time. And then the British time came in and then the modern, you know, common law came in and the whole, you know, structure complexity came in and then probably this is a temporary phase of probably a system which was borrowed and rightly so because of urbanization it doesn't, it's not possible to do a village style dispute resolution but then we have never found out or caught up with certain new things what is happening probably we were more happy with the memories and nostalgia of the Raj. So current adjudicative system is endless and elusive. Can ODR be a major solution is a question mark. I still put it as a question mark. If I look at Indian legal provisions for you just to give some understanding, there's no explicit argument for ODR. But if I put it, the one of the act which we got, Information Technology Act, which talks about one section says, a requirement of any law for information or matter to be written in printed typewritten form shall be deemed to have been satisfied if such information matter is rendered or made available in electronic form and is accessible so as to be usable for a subsequent reference. So this is one of the things which latest act really comes from the conventional mindset how evidence, how documentation has to be produced to the electronic form, which is one of the basis which you really think about how ODR could be worked out. Section 5 gives recognition to digital signatures by providing that the requirement of any law for authentication by a person's signature shall be deemed to have been satisfied if such authentication is done by means of digital signature. This is one uh, straight act which relates to cyber law. We do have an Arbitration and Conciliation Act, which, uh, which 1990 Act which try to combine uh, various provisions and then try to bring it. The chapter 5 talks about conduct of arbitral proceedings. The place of arbitration in section 20 talks the parties are free to agree on the place of arbitration. So the interpretation of the place, is it a physical place or is it a cyberspace? Or is it a place in the internet is a matter which could be interpreted if somebody wants to talk about ODR in terms of cyberspace. Notwithstanding subsection 1, subsection 2, the arbitral tribunal may, unless or otherwise agreed by the parties, meet at any place it considers appropriate for consultation among its members for hearing witness experts or parties. And again, the place is not said that it is a physical place. It could be an online space where witness or many people can meet and do things. Part three, on the conciliation part, again, the communication between the conciliator and parties, unless the parties have agreed upon the place where meetings with the conciliator are to be held, such, shall, such place shall be determined by the conciliator after consultation with the parties. So courts are accepting what the conciliator says. It's a place which, in my opinion, is also an interpretation on, you know, keeping ODR as a basis in terms of couple of acts. And let me also throw a couple of Supreme Court's interpretation. Technological advancement like fuzzy mail, internet, email were in swift progress. This is prior to the 2000 IT Act. This is a judgment before 2000 which even takes the bill which is in the process in the parliament and then made a judgment. So when parliament contemplated notice in writing to be given, we cannot overlook the fact the parliament was aware of modern devices and equipment already in O. This was a case where Supreme Court observes that rather pushing the parties to really look at modern technologies, how to really, you know, uh, uh, get out of the conventional way what they are really looking. The second case which I want to quote, when an effective consultation can be achieved by resort to electronic media and remote conferencing, it is not necessary that the two persons required to act in consultation with each other must necessarily sit together at one place unless it's a requirement of the law or ruling of the contract between the parties. Here the, here the lawyers argued that a video conferencing thing cannot be taken as an evidence and the parties have to be present in the court and the Supreme Court came out strongly and said that it is not necessary according to its views. So there is some wisdom down on the top level that they do look. But the problem, it, ODR has not come as an explicit method which leads to the subject to interpretations by subordinate courts and other things. So what blocks ODR? In, if I look at this is typically Indian perspective could be true in many spaces. Reluctance to embrace technology means very, very, uh, means, you know, it needs a socio-psychological study in India. There is a reluctance. They do get technology unless they are 100% sure. There is no question of really, I guess, really moving towards technology. When it becomes too popular everywhere, they do take it up. 
This I am talking about not the Generation X, which is embracing technology in a very, very aggressive fashion, but rather I am talking about, you know, prior to Generation X, they are quite suspicious about technology. You, ser you trust your maid servant than the washing machine because maid servant really cleans the collar very well, not the washing machines. You know, vacuum cleaner, you don't really buy. Every house has a vacuum cleaner, including my house, which is kept somewhere else. And it is the maid servant who can clean the thing because there is some level of big trust in what you call people and technology. And probably, I also have my own theory. Many of the 30, 40 years of Indian production of technology, which is indigenous, has not been qualitatively good in many ways. And that could be a big reason that technology is very risky, right? We started here in the morning in HICC, right? About technology, I don't need to do more than the demonstration what happened. Low trust on virtual environment. As they say that anonymity factor is a big problem in certain spaces and because people are, means you know, uh, people are there, I get, uh, I get very, very scary. When I go abroad after second, third day, I don't see people around me, right? I don't see people, I, I get very scared. I want a lot of people around me. And so everybody thinks that virtual environment that you are in a lonely planet. Access issues to disputants, that's a problem. Even though I said broadband, etc. the question of this access is more to the privileged IT people. Legal fraternity, not friendly to technology. This excludes Pawan Dugal, who is sitting with me, right? I'm talking about many lawyers who love to have a lot of books around them at the back to make the client believe that they are a big lawyer. They don't want a laptop or something in front of them. And then you have language issues, uh, which we did discuss as part of ICANN. As you know that every state has its uh, uh, language here, and then language is a big issue because internet is English and ODR is English is a big issue which one has to do. Lack of professionalism is one of the important part. I'm talking vis a -vis these models of ODR I'm talking. People are good in te technology, but you know, how do you really conduct business? And inertia of the bar and bench is the biggest impediment that they take it this for very light or granted, or rather, sometimes ritualistic noises are made, but there is no strong effort from the bar or the bench to really look at it. And let me also put it blunt, there is a vested interest as I told about the lawyer who chided his son, that there are vested interests because they do feel that uh, a client in hand is, you know, better than, is what than two in ODR, right? So that, that's the kind of idea what they have. So how to overcome need to sensitize policy makers? Because I also had a discussion with the Canadian registry. They asked government should keep away. But I rather say in developing country spaces, it is government which can do a lot in spite of all problems, as Mahatma Gandhi, uh, who got us independent, said once that government is an essential evil and you have to do with it. And so they are the one who can push a lot at this pace and resolve issues of access and educating SMEs who will go to benefit a lot more than the big guys who can always take like fish to water, they go to ODR. Institutionalizing training of ODR is something which has to be taken up and showcase the best practices for us to remove the fear of this technology or these uh, issues. And I rather would target new law schools, which I consider I'm part of the school. About 10, 15 are them. And many of the students are really not only lawyers, they are programmers in their own sense. And you know, they are the best bets. And they are the tomorrow's you know, bar. And tomorrow's, they are the tomorrow's bench. So sometime catch them young. And so that could be the biggest target to really look at it. And most importantly, and this I think Hong may like it and others may like it, most, most importantly, make ODR as part of the main session in the future I can meet or IGF meet, right? Justice delayed is justice denied, and ODR can play a role. Thank you for your time. Okay. How long ago was the... Oh. Panchayat system. Panchayat system has been always there in thousands of years. Even now it is existing in village level. It is being instituted as a federal form of governance. We now have a three-tier structure. The same government, the state government, more or less now. We call that as a unitary structure with federal Right. Where they don't face to face just a trust or the stuff. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for your question um, and comments. Uh, I do want to continue uh, the dialogue, but we have another speaker. It's now 2 a.m. for him. Uh, so this, uh, I guess we'd better get him on immediately. <laughs> Would you please transfer the screen to this? Link this to the screen? Yes, yes. They are doing it from that computer. Yeah, I know, I've got to plug it into mine. Oh, okay, take it, take it. Not picking, not picking up. In my mind, in 1992, when the National 
Science Foundation in the United States lifted the ban on commerce on the internet. That created a situation in which we were producing conflict and producing disputes in environmental disputes. Did not see each other, perhaps could not see each other, and in which the only way to resolve the conflict that was created was to use online methods. In the interim, I think what we've seen is that the entire field of alternative dispute resolution has evolved. And online dispute resolution technology as a narrow field has evolved toward Chinese invention. Huh? Indo Chinese invention. <laughs> no, you got something for, for yeah, what happened? Okay. Can you hear me all right? Or all right, so this presentation examines uh, well, first of all, my name is Jeff Oresti. I'm the president of Internet Bar. Uh, I'm a practicing lawyer for thirty years. I set up a bar association on the internet. Uh, three uh, years ago with several uh, lawyers and legal professionals from around the world. Uh, I uh, have my uh, website at cyberspaceattorney.com and I also am a uh, co-editor of a, a multi-author volume of uh, by the American Bar Association Guide to International Business Negotiations where we uh, have many authors from around the world and we look at the issue of how do you communicate interculturally across the internet and then we go uh, have 35 country chapters uh, where we're working. Uh, when we set up uh, Internet Bar, our primary focus was on the next billion people who are coming online. How do we enable the next billion people to uh, become <coughs> empowered? So this presentation examines how the tool of online dispute resolution technology can help the developing world promote justice and social economic development through institutionalizing a uh, multi-stakeholder consensus process. The idea that you have communications technologies uh, is that you want to use them for a purpose. And so in our case, the purpose was to uh, get people from different stakeholder groups from around the world to examine the sources of uh, difficulty in the developing world, poverty, turmoil, and injustice, and offer remedies, uh, economic development, political stability, and the rule of law. Uh, we've started a process uh, before now. We built on a best practices document uh, at the 7th International Forum uh, for 
uh, online dispute resolution, which was held in Victoria earlier this year. Uh, and at this particular program, we're proposing uh, that we develop a global ODR network uh, to continue the process uh, in conjunction with the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, so that will get us underway. So there's little doubt that the developing world faces serious obstacles. The most widely discussed, of course, uh, is poverty. Uh, the term poverty, of course, covers a lot of ground. At its uh, most extreme, it conjures images of drought, famine, or utter dis destitution. However, poverty also refers to enduring economic disadvantage, uh, exploitation, and class immobility. Most of the world's poor live a subsistence lifestyle fraught with uncertainty and powerlessness. The great tragedy of world poverty is not merely how long uh, not merely how low the quality of life of so many is, it is also how unlikely the quality of life is to change uh, in their lifetimes. Uh, turmoil is also often discussed in the developing world. War, civil or otherwise, is either a threat or a reality in many countries, and its impact on a nation's development is generally devastating. Civil war is so persistent in some regions that the developed world has grown to think of it as inevitable, like a force of nature. Even political instability, however, can be enough to stall development indefinitely. Beyond the loss of life and damage to infrastructure, political and military turmoil gives rise to rampant uncertainty. Development, whether local or international in origin, cannot be counted on to provide a lasting benefit in an environment where decades of work can be washed away uh, in a week of violence. The third difficulty facing the developing world is also the least often discussed in media coverage, the challenge of systemic injustice. Crime, corrupt, corruption, ineffective social policy, and weak representative government are all symptoms of the problem, and even nations that have a comparatively reasonable handle on the problems of poverty and turmoil often find injustice to be a real obstacle to development. The line between crime and the informal economy is often blurred in the developing world because public institutions like law enforcement are themselves so corrupted that survival requires opting into the problem just to keep food on the table. As such, many nations have injustice built into their civil and economic cultures, making reform especially difficult. In this regard, stable injustice may represent the most insidious obstacle to bringing real changes to developing nations and represents a global problem. After all, criminal organizations that dominate some neighborhoods in the developing, in the developing world are the same organizations whose fruits be they violent in nature or pharmacological in nature, reach our shores. Superficially, it is easy to speak in the abstract about how to solve the problems of the developing world. The classic response we hear from politicians seems more like playing the opposite game than it does a real policy proposal. For example, resolving poverty, we are told, is simply a matter of spurring economic development. What this means varies case by case, but generally it involves identifying what is missing in economy and saying that it should be added. This might include building infrastructure, growing trade, and ultimately raising the quality of life. We can also end turmoil by promoting stability. And again, this is often a matter of finding the linchpin to a conflict and re resolving it, such as negotiating a peaceful resolution to hostilities between neighboring countries. Promoting peaceful and meaningful elections and guaranteeing safety for warlords, vigilantes, and bandits. If we stop and think about these problems, however, we come back to our third problem. Solutions to world poverty and international civil conflict will only endure if they can find uh, purchase in a just society. Economic development can only be sustained if the rule of law is strong enough to ensure that profits will not be stolen or wasted on bribes. Political solvency in turn must at once be re resistant to radicalism but also sensitive to the demands of people it is unlikely to be sustained in a corrupt political establishment. Thus, in my view, some of the world's problems must be considered in both the short term and the long term. Short term, it is obvious that some problems can't wait a generation to improve. Ongoing warfare or famine may require drastic intervention to prevent a calamitous loss of life. However, for the impact of any such solution to hold fast over the long term, we must also seek to resolve deeper, more subtle problems of injustice in the world. So the question is, how do we address these difficulties, particularly the long-term problem of injustice? 
Any solution must be multifaceted and comprehensive in order to succeed. Traditionally, it has fallen to the state to resolve these problems. Foreign aid is often piped in directly to governments in the hope that it will be put to good use. It is quite clear, however, the state is only one actor in a much more complicated interaction. The state, for example, is merely one part of civil society. What I mean by civil society is the broader social and cultural institutions that make up day-to-day -day life. But it includes formal governmental, government traditions, but also extends to basic interactions, like how neighbors resolve disputes. Do they, do they for example, go to the police, or do they rely on local, or local elders? In many cases where government institutions are weak, they are matched by comparatively strong non-governmental civil institutions that resolve problems outside official contexts like courts. More importantly, before a particular value like negotiation or compromise can be enforced by the state, it must first have some basis in civil society. The private, act, the private sector is the other major actor in society. It is clear that the private sector includes foreign investors, but anyone who runs a business should be considered a member of this group. As such, the private sector of a nation gener necessarily overlaps with both civil society and the state, and that individuals can play multiple roles, such as the business owner who becomes a politician. The private sector is also largely responsible for rules of conflict resolution, even if we don't think of them in those terms. Customer service by its nature is often a form of dispute resolution. Thus, businesses who deal with conflicts justly will inevitably contribute to a nation's overall justice. These solutions to the problems of poverty, turmoil, and injustice can arise from all these actors, and our best chances for resolving these difficulties arrive when all actors contribute positively. It is not merely the role of the state to impose solutions in a top-down fashion. At the same time, there are those forces that contribute more heavily to the problem than to the solution. A society with a strong tradition of revenge killings, for example, may undermine the rule of law. Business interests may profit from exploiting the citizenry rather than empowering them. These forces are most evident when they coalesce into non-state entities. To be clear, when I refer to non-state entities, I'm not referring to NGOs who do a lot of good because they are officially recognized by states. NGOs can be considered part of the global civil society. Non-state entities instead referring to international organizations who exist off the grid without recognized legitimacy, such as criminal cartels or terrorist networks. In fact, in the International Herald today, it was uh, reported that the cybercrime element is clearly outpacing uh, technology as well as any law and legal enforcement efforts uh, to eradicate it. So it's easy to discuss international crime or terrorism as though these entities are distinct from normal society and in some important ways they are. However, we must recognize that these entities overlap with both civil society and with the private sector. As such, non-state entities can also cooperate with other actors to undermine the rule of law. Because these negative interactions, interactions exist, efforts to improve conditions in the developing world must do more than empower states to work with civil society and the private sector. They must also create working alternatives that non-state actors can turn to, instead of entering into partnerships with those who would undermine progress. In other words, our best bet in diminishing the influence of non-state entities over both civil society and the private sector is to empower the two groups directly to resolve the problems, in addition to strengthening the state's ability to strengthen the rule of law. Obviously, there's no single solution to these problems, but ODR is an exciting option that can serve to enhance all aspects of the developing world. Out of the many tools to promote development, ODR is an especially versatile one. Again, ODR refers to any technology that employs digital communications to bridge divides between entities. Like other forms of, al of alternative dispute resolution, ODR uses, uses a structured approach to facilitate and mediate negotiation. What makes ODR special is its potential for bridging international divides, sometimes even including language barriers. The most obvious application of ODR is economic. ODR is a powerful form of customer service because it enables long distance negotiation. ODR is even more powerful as a business to business negotiation tool, facilitating delicate and complex tax tasks like negotiating trade or contracts contracts. As such, ODR directly benefits the private sector. 
ODR may also be used to enhance civil society. While ODR obviously cannot solve all interpersonal disputes, it is a powerful means of resolving civil disagreements such as torts. The formal and slightly less personal framework of ODR may help resolve differences that would degenerate into argument or violent face-to-face. Because ODR can be used to resolve a wide variety of interpersonal differences, it reduces the burden of the state to act as a mediator. If ODR permits two individuals to resolve a tort between them, for example, it saves the state the time and the resources necessary for the courts to oversee the process. Similarly, ODR is a framework that can clarify and accelerate business-to-business negotiations. Finally, because ODR takes place outside the halls of power, it provides something of a buffer against political corruption or instability. Thus, even though ODR, in one sense, is an extra-legal phenomenon, it nevertheless enhances the rule of law by promoting fairness and, more broadly, justice. Of course, ODR presents a number of challenges to those of us who think it could benefit the developing world. The first problem is one of infrastructure. By definition, ODR requires at the very least some sort of computer with some sort of internet connection. Obviously, there are resources that are unavailable to many in the developing world. While ODR has the potential to do a lot of good in urban centers throughout the developing world where internet cafes can keep people connected, it is less clear how ODR can benefit rural areas or countries where, with poor communication infrastructure in general. Uh, additionally, ODR relies in part on agreements being at least somewhat enforceable. ODR is best suited to negotiations in which money is transferred electronically such that there is immediate compliance with the terms of the contract. When ODR is applied to more complicated scenarios such as bartering or the purchase of services, its efficacy is closely tied to the degree to which agreements are culturally or legally binding. In these cases, a corrupt police force or a weak court system may make legal recourse impossible and may limit applications of ODR. Last year, the American Bar Association World Justice Project defined the rule of law and put four specific tenets to the definition. Government and officials are accountable under the rule of law. The laws are clear, publicized, stable, and fair and protect fundamental rights, including the security and of persons and property. The process by which the laws are enacted, administered, and enforced is accessible, fair, and efficient. The laws are upheld, and access to justice is provided by competent, independent, and ethical law enforcement officials, attorneys, or representatives, and judges who are sufficient in number who are sufficient in number and have adequate resources and reflect the makeup of the community uh, that they serve. Uh, The rule of law is something that can be brought to the table with a system of online dispute resolution. Language is a big problem as well, and the language barrier is an especially difficult problem for the developing world. Reliable translators and translation software are readily available for the major European languages and a handful of others, such as Chinese or Japanese, but such resources may not be available for languages spoken in many parts of the developing world. Fortunately, English is the lingua franca of the internet today uh, and it is widely spoken spoken even in the developing world. There are also major barriers in language sophistication, however. Even in the United States, many literate Americans have difficulty understanding legal documents like contracts. In practice, language is a massive problem to which there is no magic bullet solution and fostering language education likely remains the best long-term method for enabling international negotiation and dispute resolution. Finally, we must accept the very real possibility that an ODR will attract an undesirable element that will attempt to use it as a means of perpetrating fraud. If ODR is effective in mediating financial transactions, fraudulent programs claiming to offer ODR services will inevitably follow. The best way to prevent this sort of abuse is to head these problems off at the pass. The promotion of ODR must be coupled with programs to stop the spread of disinformation. 
Uh, let me just take a quick moment to counterpose this discussion of difficulties with a discussion of the reasons we should be optimistic about the future of ODR. The most promising avenues are the advances in computing and telecommunication technologies upon which ODR must necessarily rely. A well-established ODR service will necessarily exist in the context of a robust and affordable communications infrastructure that is accessible by both customers and businesses. In the developed world, we tend to take these communications tools for granted, and it is easy to become wrapped up in a vision of ODR that assumes access to an infrastructure similar to our own. At the same time, it is just as easy to have a distorted and pessimistic view of the developing world in which we imagine sprawling 19th century cities and scattered 16th century villages. In practice, neither stereotype captures life in most of the developing world. The reality is that the whole world has, an enter has entered the 21st century, but how that transition looks can vary dramatically. The face of ODR in the developing world will very, will very likely depend upon the innovations currently being used to overcome the difficulties faced by these regions. The effort made by one laptop, one laptop per child uh, is one example of how mesh networking uh, can be used to extend the benefits of networking technology. Uh, though OLPC, one laptop per child, is designed as a teaching tool used uh, for children, it could grow into a low-cost computer for all members of the community uh, to use. Um, For now, ODR is best implemented in cooperation with existing trusted entities such as the state or the private sector. Uh, in the long term, for ODR to gain a foothold, there will very likely be a growing role for ODR certification programs. While the state may represent a good early source of support, an established ODR marketplace will likely require the expertise of specialized evaluators. And to that extent, Internet Bar is developing an ODR credentials program. Uh, but reducing opportunities uh, can be increased by the opportunity of connecting e-commerce uh, to the uh, developing world. And in that sense, uh, the Internet Bar developed a legal empowerment network, which is a collection of lawyers and legal professionals from around the world who have pledged to donate time to interact with the international community online to further the rule of law. Uh, Moving quickly through, just so that I can get to the uh, to the end, Han. Uh, Internet Bar's Peace Tones initiative sets in motion a legal empowerment network to build an online justice system by digitalizing the work of artists from developing and conflict areas globally, uh, by promoting and selling uh, music and art online, uh, and sending the revenues back in the form of e-commerce revenues to the home regions. Uh, using online dispute resolution technology, um, the American Bar Association World Justice Project became a Peace Stone sponsor uh, to get our project underway where we are uh, launching in Recife, Brazil and in three countries in Africa. Uh, we're also training uh, persons with visual handicaps to become our online mediators working in conjunction with the Carroll Center uh, for the Blind. Um, in conclusion, uh, ODR can support or stand in for a burdened state, can enrich civil society pro by promoting compromise and benefit the private sector, um, but we must build trust. Uh, we need to work from here, uh, and in conjunction with Hong, we're proposing the development of a global ODR development panel in the form of a dynamic coalition uh, for the IGF. Uh, to be a driving force for building a trusted online community responsible for building an online justice system to alleviate poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Another, another workshop, we've used this room, so we cannot be late. I'm going to play the podcast. I thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to speak at the Internet Governance Forum. I, just a couple of days ago, spoke at another e-government forum or e-governance forum in Cairo, but I think it was rather a different kind of e-governance. Uh, the people at this conference today, I understand, are more interested in governing the e in e-government, the internet itself, whereas the conference
conference I spoke to a couple of days ago was e-government, and that is how to use electronic means to enhance government functions. I don't claim any expertise in most of the internet governance issues that make up your uh, agenda at this conference, but I do have some comments on the relationship between e-government, e-governance, and online dispute resolution. And understand that I'm approaching this from the point of view of a practitioner who uses electronic tools uh, basically every day in his practice, and so that's the orientation that I'm bringing to this presentation. Before discussing the role of ODR in e-governance, uh, I think it's important to understand my take on the scope of dispute resolution, which is rather broad. Dispute resolution is more than the resolution 